29th of September. Today is the day when the world celebrates World Heart Day. The idea has been in circulation around the world since the late 1990s. It was the idea by the World Health Federation chief at that particular time, Anthony De Luna, and it was taken up then by the World Health Organization. And the idea behind, behind celebrating this World Heart Day is to create awareness, to remember that the organ that we all depend so heavily on needs our attention. And with that, along with this awareness, the World Health Organization and the World Heart Federation want to spread the message about cardiac diseases, their importance, to create an awareness, education, and information which will help prevent, manage, and control heart disease. Heart disease, as you all know, is rampant across the world. About 18 to 19 million people die of it annually. And we in India, in particular, are unfortunately uh, very, very badly affected by this disease, which is almost like an epidemic. And the ischemic heart disease or the heart disease, which ironically affects the organ that supplies blood to the rest of the body, is caused by a reduction in the blood flow to the heart, is causing a huge amount of damage to the health of individuals in this country. The entirety of the problem has confounded experts over the years, but through the World Heart Day being celebrated all across and an information being spread through all corners of the world, the modern man is far more informed about the organ than he was, let's say, 60 years ago or 70 years ago. The developments in the field of cardiology and cardiac surgery have resulted in many of us benefiting and the longevity of life has certainly been improved. From the perspective of this year's uh, World Health Day or World Heart Day, sorry, the theme which annually varies this year has been made into harnessing the power of digital health. And this is fortunate in many ways because digital health has really got a huge flip during the COVID pandemic when many of us would have to resort to telehealth, which is a part and parcel of digital health. We are very fortunate at Fortis Healthcare that amongst us, we have the best technologies in many of our centers, centers of excellence, we are headed in incidentally by a gentleman who happens to be himself a cardiac surgeon, Dr. Ashutosh Raghuvanshmi, who is the MD and CEO of the company. And today we have the honor and privilege of hosting three of the countries, and I would say uh, amongst the best in the world, cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. So let me, without further ado, Welcome to this forum, the three gentlemen who will be informing you, educating you, and warning you, perhaps, about heart disease. Their implications are massive, not just to the society that we belong to, but also to the world. Because along with the morbidity, the mortality uh, is a massive, massive influence, particularly amongst the youngsters, because heart disease, which used to be a disease of the elderly, is now beginning to affect the youngsters. So the three gentlemen that we have with us in our studios today are Professor Ashok Seth, who is chairman of the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and also the chairman of the Fortis Medical Council. We have Professor Lochin Clare, who is the chairman of the newly opened today, in fact, of the Fortis Medical Research Institute, and congratulations to him for that, and also of the Fortis uh, Art and Vascular Institute 
at Fortis Vasantpur. And from Bangalore joining us today is Dr. Vivek Lovely, who is the chairman of the Cardiovascular Sciences Center in Bangalore. He incidentally has a leading role to play from the perspective of uh, medical education in this country because he is a nominated member of the uh, National Medical Council, which first while used to be called the Medical Council of India. These three gentlemen have such long CVs that if I were to go into the details of their achievements, their papers, their publications, etc., all half an hour will be taken by them. But these names, these places are familiar, not just to those countries, but also in the Indian community. So, gentlemen, welcome. And let me begin by asking uh, a question straight away. Uh, let me begin by first of all that Dr. Kurt and Dr. Kurt happen to be cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, and electrophysiologists in case of Dr. Blair. And Dr. Vivek Jabbi is a cardiac surgeon. So, uh, Dr. Claire, let me start by you first. From the perspective of heart disease, is this a lifestyle disease or is it a genetic disease? And if it's a lifestyle disease, how do we prevent it? Yeah, Dr. Lotum, it is a pleasure uh, being part of this webinar. We are monitoring the uh, conducting the webinar, uh, <clears throat> so there is no doubt uh, that today uh, coronary artery, uh, diabetes, and hypertension. These three diseases are the most important killer in India. And I have no doubt that uh, these three diseases are primarily left in the world. But diabetes uh, also plays a role uh, in this. Uh, I think uh, apart from the lifestyle which has changed in the last 30 or 35 years in India, uh, Indians are genetically also more predisposed uh, to coronary artery disease. I tell you why. There are two kind of theories for that. One is the theory of deprivation. That in Indian subcontinent, the food was uh, not available so uh, easily. So people used to live on a very meager uh, diet uh, many, many years back. And then, you know, we had the agriculture revolution and uh, the income increased. So the food availability became much better as compared to 50 or 100 years back. So people started eating more, but genetically we are supposed to eat much less. So though we eat so much less, but that is also more for Indians because of uh, the genetic uh, disposition or the so-called definition. That is one. The second thing is that we have an unfavorable lipid profile. Our lipid profile is unfavorable. What happened that in India we have cholesterol a little bit elevated. The HDL is cholesterol low in India. LDL which is bad cholesterol is a little bit high. And triglycerides are high, and the the low, so very low density lipoprotein is high. So if you have the lipid high over all across India, this is the pattern you get very commonly. And when you have a low HDL and relatively low LDL, that is not a good thing for uh, the coronary arteries or even the vascular system. So this predisposes to uh, the development of uh, uh, deposits inside the vascular system, whether it is the heart arteries, whether it is brain arteries, whether it is kidney arteries, or there are arteries of the legs. So depending upon the circulation, you develop the disease. In the heart, you develop coronary artery disease. People get heart attacks and people in general, symptoms of heart failure. If it is the brain, they get stroke. If it is the kidney, they get kidney failure. If it is the leg, they get pencil vascular disease. So even the, even the kidney failure in India, the, the chronic renal failure, the most important cause is the diabetes and hypertension. So I think the lifestyle has certainly changed. You know, previously, every physical, we used to work hard from morning to evening, walking or cycling. 
even everything in world work even if people need to use hand pump to get water and to bring their food they go to fields but now because of the mechanization uh, we are using more of more technology so our physical activity has decreased so that is one thing the second thing is that the junk food has come into the country uh that it is burger or that it is a, a, a kentucky fried chicken uh, the, the, uh, potato chips and then smoking also increased in last 30 40 years the western civilization they when they understood the negative points of smoking they have the, the tobacco industry pushed the smoking to the third world and we are afflicted and now it is a sad story in india that even the females have started smoking the college girl and the high middle class and high class ladies they start smoking and then lots of exercise you know no exercise at all people just go to take vegetables on the car they don't walk and lastly but not the i think perhaps one of the most important thing is that the stress in the society has increased tremendously and we have not learned how to de-stress ourselves and another point in india what has happened in my opinion is that in india last 30 40 years there has been a very rapid but very chaotic urbanization you know like 40 years back only 15% people were in the in the in the cities 80 85% were in the villages but now that figure is much down around almost 40% people have come to cities in very short span of time the they come to the city they have to earn money they don't have the place to live they have to really struggle hard so i think these are the uh, reasons of the sudden increase of cardiovascular disease Well, thank you. Uh, that that was amazing. Uh, may I just uh, take you to another aspect? That is the aspect of patients probably coming to all of us a little late in life. So, Professor Seth, uh, the question is to you: What should be your message, or what would be your message to each and every person in the society? When should they? really think that they need to go to the hospital because particularly in india everything is supposed to be emanating from the allergy tract so if somebody gets a little bit of acidity you start thinking it's a stomach problem if you have some pain you think it's a stomach problem so what do you think are the warning signs which the population at large needs to factor in and the second part So that relates to something that Dr. Mayer mentioned a little while ago. Is should there be a preventive health program that needs to be encouraged so that people who think that they are young and they are in the prime of health do get a screening done at the right time? Dr. Seth, please. So, so uh, Dr. Puri, you have raised a very important point. Uh, firstly, let's address this issue about. checkups checkups uh, we clearly understand that prevention is the best strategy for coronary artery disease we at the moment the world capital of heart attacks india is the world capital of heart attacks deaths from heart yes. attacks have increased literally 300% over the last 20 to 25 years so when we look at that and more recently unfortunate incidents of young celebrities dying uh, has really created a concern and also a uh, uh, focus towards prevention and it's reminded us that prevention is so important uh, now importantly most importantly people should have checkup but the ones who need checkup at a very early age are the ones who've got a family history of heart disease which means either of the parents having heart attacks or sudden death at an early age because family history is one of the most important predictors of a person getting heart heart, uh, heart problems at an early age the second group who should also get checked up very early is patients with diabetes patients with high blood pressure those who are smokers and for these people checks should start by the age of 20 blood tests should start by the age of 20 but by by the age of 30 many of these people should also be requiring a ct scans of the coronary arteries to see calcification even to see early blockages because institution of risk factor risk. modifications if it comes in early in life especially those with family history and those with diabetes 
will actually prevent heart attacks for the future. And by the way, minor blockages are killers. We always think that only serious blockages that can, can create heart attacks. Minor blockages can create heart attacks. Even 30% blockages can create heart attacks. And that's the one which we commonly see uh, in younger people. And when you hear of this situation where a person was seemingly very well, was exercising or was going to gym regularly and suddenly is found dead or has a has a sudden death it's usually it's usually heart attacks which cause that so we must remember this that's why checkups are important by the age of 40 practically all indians especially males are susceptible to heart disease we by the way are 10 years early in heart disease than the west our average age of having Heart attacks is 58 instead of 68 in the West. So that's the first aspect. And secondly, you said, Ki, when do you think that somebody should really seek help? Um, symptoms of discomfort in the chest on walking, which get relieved at rest, is an important symptom which has been indicated as a, as a symptom of heart disease. But I want to also educate people that, that may be typical. Now, 25% of the heart attacks occur without symptoms. In fact, 25% of heart disease occurs without symptoms. So that's another important aspect. So regular checks help to pick up that. Uh, secondly, diabetics may not even have a chest discomfort. They may just complain of breathlessness on exertion and sometimes may not have any symptoms and just have silent heart attacks. So that's another thing to note that breathlessness on exertion could be a symptom of blockages. And finally, many people have indigestion and heart attacks can present as indigestion, acidity. And unfortunately, I don't want to scare people by saying that everybody who has an acidity should now start thinking they've got heart attacks. But I must also emphasize that we see enough patients who keep thinking this is acidity. And they keep strolling around at night thinking it's acidity till when morning happens and they've had a full-blown heart attack. So I would say in practical terms, those who feel it's acidity should actually take acidity medicine and if it doesn't get relieved in 15 to 20 minutes and continues for more than an hour, it is imperative to get to a hospital, do an ECG and make sure that it is not a heart attack and that it's only acidity. I must tell you that I've had acidity. I could have sworn that those symptoms were truly heart attack. It actually sounded to me I was going to have a heart attack. I had an ECG. Then only I felt that, no, it was acidity and not a heart attack. So I think it's a very important warning not to ignore acidity, which does not respond to the usual medicine within 20 minutes to half an hour. Thanks, sir. Ashok, uh, if, I, if I can add here, uh, Murutam, uh, sure. it was a very, very important thing what Ashok has, uh, 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 you know, discussed. I tell you that in what, <coughs> for the three years of my experience in India, there are two enemies of people, two enemies of cardiology service. One is the uh, fixation with gas, another is the acidity. And believe me, these are not, there are no diseases like gas. There is no diagnosis like gas. There is no diagnosis like acidity. I don't know what they mean by that. They may mean uh, upper uh, abdominal discomfort. So sometimes people come, sir, I am in pain here, it must be gas, you know. I think there is gas in your brain rather than anywhere else. So what Ashok said is very right that please, please don't assume that you have gas problems. There's nothing called gas problem. Because whenever you down, whenever you have a discomfort which lasts more than 20 minutes, I would say, please go and take an ECG at least in nearby center. Don't neglect yourself. I have seen doctors, believe me, not going to the doctor, not going to the medical emergency, taking pentosid for three days. Then after three days, he lands into the emergency with extensive myocardial infarction, rejection pressure dropping to 25%. So this is a problem in India. I think we need to address that. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Vivek, I'll bring you here and uh, refer to the two points that these two eminent cardiologists have raised. One is that you know, somehow Indians are genetically uh, more prone to getting heart disease. And as Dr. Seth said, I think that perhaps they get earlier and die much more than the. You've opened the chest of many of these people. 
what do you find is there an anatomical difference between the indian heart and the heart of the others that you see this type or you see in the world what is it that causes us to be, become more prone to the other than the factors that these two gentlemen have already referred to thank you pleasure to be with you all here there are enough epidemiological studies done especially in us which is a cauldron of ethnicities that the south asians are far more prone to get coronary artery disease than the other ethnicities number 2 these people who develop more commonly heart disease the course of the disease is likely to be more malignant when you do an angiogram you find more of them unlike the western or the black counterparts have more diffuse disease more widespread disease and most of many of them would be meriting an invasive procedure a single straight forward block angioplasty a multiple diffuse uh, tight blocks bypass surgery when we open them up we find that the indians a tend to have more diabetes b tend to have more inflammatory looking like disease and more widespread blocks number 3 Indians seem to have more smaller coronary arteries, smaller internal mammary arteries, unlike the Arabs or the Western people or the Black people, where it makes the surgery difficult. An Indian goes to United States or goes to some other countries, and those people are used to be operating on bigger arteries. Those operations are much easy, and they end up operating on an Indian once in a while. That will be very challenging, and so. these people require certain different take and approach to surgical techniques and we tend to put more arterial grafts the internal mammary on both sides the radial arteries from the arms the gastrocnemius artery from the abdomen and also there is a technique called the y grafts where we join two arterial grafts and do multiple joining of these arteries to the multiple uh, coronary arteries so these grafts will last longer and undoubtedly because of this challenge especially the females many of the females are little puny they are little shorter and they tend to have very difficult small vessels which are surgically a great challenge so uh, the experienced indian surgeons are very good coronary artery surgeons and wherever they go in the world and operate coronary artery bypass surgeries they would really be a notch above their counterparts so vivek uh, uh, thank you so much uh, one other question uh, for any one of you to answer and we'll start with you dr clair uh, a lot of uh, indians believe that the cardiologists usually advise alcohol for but clear advice that, that i have talked to ever mention how much so a i want you to uh, dispel any doubts whether alcohol is good or bad for coronary disease and secondly how much is good how much is bad what kind of alcohol if at all it is to be used and the second question which is related particularly in the west a lot of recreational drugs uh, for example marijuana etc are getting legalized do you think that this kind of a, because we tend to ape what the west does if this comes into india there will be a price for uh, us to pay from the point of view of cardiac health i think very very important question narottam you have asked and uh, you know i am from punjab and in every meeting this is the most important question <clears throat> now let me tell you my own views alcohol is not good for anything to, to the body it does not benefit any any organ of the body including heart this is my concept now now i will tell you that there are studies to uh, show that taking a red wine particularly these studies were done in france uh, the coronary artery disease is less in these uh, people but i really don't believe in the validity of those studies because many of those studies were sponsored by the alcohol industry itself so as far as i am concerned i will tell people that if possible don't take alcohol at all of course smoking should be zero but if you do not have these few things for example if you don't have a liver disease if you don't have any major neurological uh, issue uh, some you know parkinson and things of that nature 
if you are a if you are a not a unstable personality there are some guys they take one 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 pack and then start fighting with their uh, uh, you know counterparts and this and that then there are you know there are some people who are uh, you who are genetically uh, they are prone to get addicted you know they don't stop at particular level one or two pack then they, they go on increasing so if you think that your patient doesn't fall in these categories and his he doesn't have a diabetes which is not controlled if his blood pressure is not controlled i will to know to all these groups they don't take alcohol at all but if all these factors are not there the person has a reasonably good uh, uh, health and he, he his diabetes is under control his blood pressure is under control and he does a regular exercise he is not really gross uh, obese i will say that if you if you enjoy drinking take social drinking and what is social drinking by recommendation it is two small uh, whiskey that mean 30 ml each 60 to 70 ml of any uh, whiskey uh, it is one glass of red wine and one pint of beer which is allowed and this quota by the way this is this can be taken every day there are, there is nothing called that you take two days or three days a week but if you don't exercise, you know exceed these uh, limits which is very important but mostly what happens that uh, these uh, sharabis alcoholics you know they they tend to imagine they will take 90 ml they say it's 30 ml <laughs> so you know so what i recommend is that please use the measure available you know there is a measure available one side is 30 ml another side is 60 ml so please measure and i have seen myself what i used to think is less it is actually more so this this is my kind of concept on on uh, drinking but i think if you really love drinking if you enjoy drinking sitting with your friend drinking in in a limited amounts i will certainly allow no okay, coming to so this what the uh, recreational drugs the recreational drugs yeah. you know i we don't have much experience of recreational drugs in this india uh, <coughs> but i think uh, looking at the uh, looking at the uh, people's educational background and our uh, most majority of the people not really understanding the uh, effects of these kind of drug if i have to decide i will i will say don't allow these drugs in india dr seth you are a pioneer in many <laughs> walks of cardiology internationally re renowned international cardiologists uh you've done many new techniques as has dr clare and dr uh, javli too in their respective fields uh just enumerate some outstanding new technology that has aided and abetted you in helping a patient recover or save his life which you wouldn't have been able to do let's say 5 or 10 years ago I think that's Anything? that's one of the easy things for me to answer uh because truly what has revolutionized what I see as a miracle I mean I've seen numerous developments and thankfully been privileged to contribute to many numerous advancements of science and technology over the last 30 years and been responsible for it also in Asia and in India but what actually for me has been the defining moment of seeing a miracle and the miracle happened and started i would say with a great pride it started from india is the transcatheotic valve replacement uh to believe 20 years ago if somebody had, and in fact it was the inventor of the technique a close friend of mine in france did tell me that he was working on a way to replace the valve of a heart without surgery and to me it seems so weird a conversation this just 20 years ago and i asked him how can you do that and he says just watch it i'm at the moment can't reveal much because i'm working on animals well we were privileged in 2004 to be one of the first centers to do a first in human study and actually the first transcatheotic valve replacement has started from india now that technique has absolutely changed the sphere of aortic valve replacement in the elderly to change a valve without an operation without a, 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 a opening up the chest without opening up the heart i mean truly what open heart surgery is not bypass surgery open heart surgery is the valve surgery where you actually open the heart and stitch the valve inside the heart over the last 15 years the technique progressed 
over the last 10 years, it has absolutely taken over and the last five years have been immense in various science, research, trials proving that not just was it a superior technique to, for those people who can't have surgery, but it's also for those people who could have surgical aortic valve replacement in the elderly, even those who were low risk for surgical aortic valve replacement in the elderly, move far ahead with a technique that nearly 25% of the surgeons across the world themselves perform the transcatheter based methodology, which means like an angioplasty, putting catheters up into the, uh, into, into the aorta and Im implanting a valve in a conscious patient in a cath lab with no cuts and a valve gets implanted, the patient, you then tell the patient, now your valve is implanted and the patient says, thank you, gives you a smile and he goes off the table, the he's eating food in four hours time, he's walking around the next day and ready to go home. Some of these can go home even before our angioplasty patients can go home. Now that is a revolution and I, I must say, these are fascinating advancements in science, almost like a miracle. If you can imagine 15 years ago, if I couldn't believe it, then in 15 years to have 300,000 of these procedures going on and, 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 you know, around the world, it is a big move forwards. And yes, these are the techniques which save lives. I've had patients who've come in who are 75, even 70 year olds, 65 year olds who've come in into gasping on a ventilator with their valve absolutely closed and narrowed, perhaps didn't even have 24 hours to live, who actually would have been absolutely extremely high risk for surgery because they had failing hearts, have been taken to the cath lab, the valve opened, implanted, and they've survived it in 48 hours on the ward within three days back to home, still feeling good after many years. So. But also this has happened. I don't think this is to do with surgery versus versus intervention. Actually, these advancements have happened because surgeons, interventional cardiologists, radiologists, uh, echo specialists all got together to say, how do we progress better for the mankind? How, we do, how do we do things? Firstly, for those who can't have a surgery even, a very high risk group, which was actually being left alone to die. How could we help them? and gradually turning it into a technique which became simpler and simpler and safer and safer only by cooperation and, and say, let's do trials and let's now start picking up who's the right patient. And believe you me, this transformation of medical science is happening because many minds and specializations are no more fighting with each other, actually cooperating with each other to say, how do we do the best for the patient when we get into the 21st century? What do we do? What do we do into the next decade and how will our patients fare better with simpler, safer, minimally invasive techniques with multiple specialities combined together to give the best? So, yes, transformation, that's the sort of, uh, you know, miracles that we've uh, medical science has given us over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, should we say. Thank you, uh, Dr. Javli. You know, India has this problem of uh, not only having the issue of ischemic heart disease, that is heart failure due to uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks as they call it, because the blood supply is compromised and you require either stenting or bypass surgery as you referred to. But India also has the dubious distinction of still being saddled with a lot of faulty valves because of rheumatic heart disease. The world is seeing less and less of it, but I'm sure you are operating on a still a large number of mitral and aortic valves and <coughs> multi-valve disorders for uh, uh, rheumatic heart disease. So has there been any change? For example, during the earlier days, every valve needed to be replaced by synthetic valves, but then mitral valve repairs started. Do you think that this progression is actually helpful? And what is the stage that we are in in India? He is muted. You know, Mrotam, he is not heard. He is muted. Tell him to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Me. Okay. I would talk about surgery. Let's quickly run through both the heart attacks and the valves. As India became advanced, more educated, more affluent, 
uh, can we have the others unmu uh, muting their mics? So we saw that the rheumatic heart disease is now dramatically coming down, both in its uh, in its numbers and its virulence, both in the urban and rural areas. We are seeing less and less rheumatic heart disease. But when somebody comes with a rheumatic heart disease, we find that those valves are very badly damaged. They come late and they have to be replaced. If somebody is young, we put metallic valve, which can last for 300 years. And somebody is old, we put tissue valve, which will not require the anti-clotting drugs. But there are people who can come early for surgery. And this is an important advice that anybody is found to have a heart problem. This advice is for general public and also practitioners of medicine. Send them to the surgeon early. If the patients come to the surgeon early and we find that there is not too much of scarring, the valve tissue is very good and pliable and nice, all these valves can be repaired and the God-given valve can be maintained. Today, we also have advances where all these operations are done minimally invasive. That means we do a small side incision, use endoscopes, and we can repair or replace the valve. But a large, almost every mitral valve that comes to us is intent to repair. If not possible on table, then replace. Now, more and more aortic valves are also being repaired, and all the tricuspid valves are rep uh, repaired. Where the bypass surgery is concerned, in 1960s in the world, three people did bypass surgery first time, not knowing the other had done. In India, we started doing it in 70s, early 70s. We were stopping this heart, then, uh, uh, I mean, putting it on a heart leg machine, stopping and operating. In 1991, in Bangalore, in this small so called 40s hospital, I mean, Wokhart Hospital, which is now 40s, 100 bed hospital, we did India's first beating heart surgery. Australasia is actually beating heart surgery means don't put them on heart lung machine, use certain surgical skill and certain gadgetry and do it on the surface of the heart without stopping the heart like a general surgery. God did not mean the blood to go on plastics, heart to be stopped. So if you do that, whatever grossly, we may not find any problem, but microscopically you find that has now today picked up so much that 70% of India's surgery is beating heart without heart lung machine surgery. And there we are world leaders. In 1995, in that same hospital in Bangalore, we championed India's minimally invasive bypass surgery. Today, in 1997, we established the world's organization called ISMIX, International Society of Minimally Invasive Cardiac Surgeons in Paris. It has become a huge banyan tree now. In India, now a lot many surgeons are routinely doing minimally invasive bypass surgery, minimally invasive valve surgery and congenital heart surgery. Bangalore has now got a lot of young, good surgeons where they are routinely doing minimally invasive surgery in many centers. Bangalore has become kind of a capital of India's minimally invasive valve, I mean, hearts, I mean, coronary bypass surgery and valve surgery. So we have come a long way. None of the patients are really inoperable. Very difficult patients can be put on a machine called intraortic balloon pump and operated and can be seen through postoperatively. If the patients have got a bad heart failure or post operatively get into problem, we can put them on something called an ECMO, ele uh, elective heart lung machine on the bedside and can be taken care of. Patients sometimes in a small nursing home are have, have arrested, stopped the heart, restarted. We can go in a van, carry the ECMO machine, on site put the ECMO and bring them back. People who have been, op for last 40 years, we have been doing stents, operating them, we have very successfully treated them and made them survive. But all these people who survived after a major heart attack have now come up with bad hearts, heart failure. All these patients can now be, uh, can if they're really bad at the dead end, they can all undergo heart transplants or artificial heart. A lot of people, the world doesn't know, and many people in the governance do not know that before the pandemic started, India was doing world's highest number of heart transplants. And today, now the pandemic is ebbing out. Again, the donor hearts have started climbing up. Give us three, four years after the pandemic, and we will surprise the world. Thank you. Uh, Thank before you. we take the question and answers, I'd just like to go back to Dr. Claire and talk about a little bit about the recent advances of which you have been a very important part about uh, the small size pacemakers 
that have come into the market. And you were one of the pioneers of physiology. Uh, just a word before we take the question and answers from you, Dr. Claire, about what kind of technologies are now available for pacemakers and what do you do for patients who have irregular rhythms? Uh, that is the RF ablation. There must be so many new things happening. Just a couple of examples before we get to the question and answers. Right. <clears throat> See, one thing is, uh, uh, Dr. Narottam, uh, one, of, one of the most uh, fascinating and important developments have occurred in the field of cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, I would say just just 20, 25 years back, there was actually no not much treatment for uh, arrhythmias, and we used to just uh, go on giving them medication. Patient will remain symptomatic. They will come again and again with tachycardias, increased heart rate, pulse 200. So you terminate them with some medication, put them on medication, then they it, it was a real, real kind of mess. But now I tell you that uh, so much has been uh, the fast development in uh, uh, treatment that uh, most of the arrhythmias have become curable. Curable means that they can be totally treated uh, forever. The patients uh, with uh, uh, practically normal heart, for example, if they have uh, arrhythmias coming from the upper chamber of the heart, so called atrial tachycardia, or from the junction of the heart, which is called AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. That means they are based on some excessive connection between the atria and the ventricles. And these are 98 99% success rates of ablation, which is done under local anesthesia <coughs> and the patient cured for life. Actually, you know, uh, in heart disease, uh, there is only, uh, uh, you know, some of the arrhythmias which can be permanently cured. Nothing else is permanently cured. If you have a, a coronary artery disease, you do bypass surgery or you stenting, these patients will come back again with something or the other. So it is an amelioration, but in uh, supraventricular tachycardia and even the ventricular tachycardia in a normal heart, these patients are curable. Now, when we come to the complex arrhythmias, for example, ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, uh, atrial fibrillation is one of the common arrhythmias in the world today. Almost uh, as the age goes on increasing, the chance of AF, atrial fibrillation, go on increasing. By the time you reach 80, almost 80% of people will have atrial fibrillation. So you can imagine the amount of quantum of problem in the world. And uh, we didn't have much to do, in, uh, to do these patients. Now we can cure them also the radiation fibrillation. We have new technologies uh, where we can take, uh, we can understand the the activation of the heart and how in the heart the wave front is going like from the right atrium to the left atrium or the other way around it's coming from the left atrium to the right atrium and similarly in the ventricular tachycardia we can we can define the path of the tachycardia by the three dimensional technology like one of the technologies the car to technology and i'm happy to announce today on this uh, webinar that we have the the Carto 7 version, which is the first machine in India in South region, which is available in our uh, institute uh, to ablate these uh, arrhythmias. Now, another <coughs> area where, you know, like previously people used to have, like somebody had a myocardial infarction, he's got a low ejection infection. We used to put them on ICD, but sometimes they will have a repeated shock from the ICD because VT is occurring again and again. Now we can do ablation for these patients and the results are fascinating. You know, we got a patient from uh, Kabul who he, he had 50 shots in one day. 50 shots. We did RF ablation under Cardo and two years now he is almost like a class one. Another doctor came from uh, Sikkim again 30 40 shocks in one day and he had an ICD already. And uh, you can imagine the amount of pain he went through getting repeated shocks, 30 shocks in a day. So we ablated him and he's doing very well. <coughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I would say that in epidemiology now, there is nothing which we can't handle, almost nothing which we can't handle. These yes. Patients. Now, one of the latest developments in the field which has happened is in the pacemaker. How we paste the heart. Previously, we used to put one uh, wire in the atrium, one wire in the right ventricle. But we know that the God has made our heart in a way that the, the pulse starts from the right upper chamber, from the sinus node, it will depolarize the atria, 
then the it will go to the AV mode and the ventricle. So then the the, the the depolarization of the heart is from top to bottom like this. When you put the needle point into the apex, the the wave front will be totally reversed. That means it's starting from the apex of the right ventricle and going to stimulate the ventricle in a reverse direction. So this is not physiological. Eight to ten percent of the people who started with a normal injection fraction at the time of complete heart block, they were given pacemaker, they will develop heart failure. But now what we do is we do the conduction system pacing. That means we don't put the ventricular lead into the right ventricular apex or even into the septum. We want to stimulate even the disc to this or the left bundle. That means the, we want to use the conduction system of the heart so that the connection is on the normal route. So you, we did uh, the first connection system pacing in 2015 in India. And now we have taken this program forward and we have done 180 cases, which is one of the largest in, in the world uh, of connection system pacing. So now our standard of care is any patient who is pacing, any patient, either for ready indication, low heart rate, or we do a CRT, we do conduction system pacing. And believe me, the results are excellent uh, in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is there is a lot uh, that we can continue to talk about. We haven't even touched the surface of the heart, so to say, because we haven't talked about the heart disease, which India has a lot of. Food. But then, how much can we possibly accommodate? These three gentlemen are absolutely the top most heart disease that India produces. So we're really, really fortunate at Fort Self here that we've got the surface of the best that we have to offer. From the perspective of uh, drugs, there has also been a massive uh, improvement and that has helped uh, a lot of people survive, particularly drugs for heart failure. And also the investigative method methodology that are now available to it, it mentioned about the CT scan uh, to uh, measure the calcific deposit. Also, the various modalities that are used intraoperatively to measure the uh, the flow of blood, free and stenting, etc. These have changed. The entire paradigm of treatment has changed. But we will talk about this probably in successive years as the world heart rate reappears on the horizon on every September the 29th. And hopefully we'll have the services of three, these three gentlemen available. At the present moment, we are there for you to answer some of the questions and answers. And I hand you over to my colleague, Deepayat. So, Narottam, I have one sentence. And I want to tell the viewers in this, uh, in this webinar that with the God's grace in India, at least in many centers in uh, um, NCR in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, in Kolkata, in Bombay. The treatment of every heart disease is available with the same capability as best in the world. We can do everything, believe what is being done in Washington, D.C., or in uh, San Francisco. Uh, we, can, we, have, we have the heart transplant ability, we have the artificial heart, we do the latest technology in electrophysiology and international cardiology. We do terror, we do well, well, we do mitra clip. So, yes, you know, in heart failure, particularly, we have advanced a lot. New drugs have come up, our new group of drugs, and like CRT therapy, production system pacing, and a lot has happened in India. Now, I tell patients that if a patient of heart disease is is having wisdom and is looking for why they have occur some wisdom in their brain and they have money. Patient of heart disease should not die from heart problems. Yeah, but the message uh, is quite clear, uh, friends, that you've got to prevent heart disease if you possibly can. If you can't get to the hospital as early as you can. And as Dr. Javi also mentioned, the cardiac surgeon, if you have a disease, come to us quicker, you will probably go back a completely healthy man. And the gamut treatment available in India at almost all the centers across the Indian metropolis and also major cities. 
we are populated with technology and with good people. So, so over to you for a question and answer. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, the dispersal of knowledge from your games today. Uh, Dr. Seth, Dr. Javli, and Dr. Kher, thank you very much. Thank you. Question and answers. Please stay with us, Dr. Javli. Does, Does over exercise have any implications? So, uh, uh, over to you, Bipan. Sorry. Yeah, let me answer this question. Over exercise have any implications? Uh, Mr. Nikola has asked a very good question. Uh, see, our recommendation is that we should do moderate exercise. Moderate exercise means walking, uh, jogging, light jogging, playing some game, swimming. High intensity exercise can be of the heart. Now, you know, there are two kinds of people who can be harmed with high intensity exercise. One is those people who have got undetected hidden coronary artery disease that they have blockages but they don't have symptoms. If they do high intensity exercise, they can develop heart attack, they can develop cardiac arrest. Now, there is another group of patients, in fact, which people don't realize, particularly young people. If they do high intensity exercise, they can develop ventricular fibrillation. Fibrillation means the heart stops like a cardiac arrest. So, what are those kind of patients? One is a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in fact, uh, sudden cardiac death uh, below the age of 35, the most important cause is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not heart attack. The second entity is there is something called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. This is a uh, this is a disease where the uh, fibrosis, uh, the heart muscle of the right ventricle is replaced by fibrous tissue, and these patients become prone to get arrhythmias. And if you exercise, exercise can high intensity exercise can bring on VT or ventricular fibrillation. Another you know, uh, few of these other conditions are like the Brugada syndrome, there is a special change in the ECG, their echoes are normal, and QT prolongation. You know, QT prolongation is another disease where and the ECG, the QT interval is increased. So, in India, people, anyone who dies suddenly, get a heart attack. No, in fact, sudden cardiac death, 85% of the deaths are not acute heart attack. They are basically because of the lethal ventricular arrhythmia. Either most of these patients, they have some kind of heart disease. Either their heart function is poor, their pumping capacity is poor, ejection capacity is poor. Because of the previous there is a disease called heart muscle disease, cardiomyopathy. And you know, in India, people don't work that up. So they may have already existing left ventricular dysfunction, they are prone to arrhythmia. If your ejection fraction is below 35%, you are to six times more prone to that sudden cardiac death as compared to normal people. So that is one issue which we have to address. The second issue is that people who want to take high intensity exercise, they want to go to competitive sports, they should have a cardiac checkup before embarking on, on this kind of exercise program. You know, I, I tell people in India, there should be mandatory three examinations of the heart. One is in the time of war, at the time of birth. Even then, some of the diseases can be missed if not seen properly. The second checkup of heart should be when the child goes to school first time. And third checkup should be when they do her first job. If we do these three mandatory cardiac checkup, then we can detect a lot of disease in time and we can treat them very, very effectively. Dr. Jawali brought in a very good point. You know, in India, the cardiologists as well as patients, they go on delaying the treatment. They go on delaying the treatment. For example, somebody has a mild regurgitation. By the time they come to the surgeon, their heart is so big, their atrium is so big, they are already in atrial fibrillation. Then that atrial fibrillation will remain forever. That will never be cured. So my philosophy is that they should be sent to for treatment to the surgeon in time so that a lot of problems of the heart can be cured.
covid recovered covid recovered patients should watch out for what signs of signs to prevent heart tissue heart issues clear you can answer it again yeah you know basically uh, if the patient have recovered from covid uh, if you know if they had a uh, moderate to severe disease if they had a mild disease uh, we don't uh, advise every patient to have a cardiac checkup particularly young people <coughs> but if anybody had a moderate to severe moderate mean that they had lung involvement their saturation dip to some uh, for some time they had to have oxygen even though they were treated at home that's a moderate disease but people who needed icu care that's a severe disease so all the patients who had moderate to severe disease irrespective of the age maybe 20 even 25 they should have a proper cardiac checkup after two months of recovery ecg and echocardiography these two investigations are must apart from that we take history and do the physical examination a lot of these patients who have recovered from covid they have uh, uh, palpitation they have a sinus tachycardia or some of the patients they went to bradycardia i know a patient admitted with covid heart rate going to 35 sinus run i didn't have to use temporary pacemaker but there are some patients who needed temporary pacemaker and another problem very common is this atrial fibrillation heart rate being irregular so uh, you have to see two things one is echo it will tell you whether there is any damage to the heart whether the patient has myocarditis secondly you take your ecg and if it's not a normal rhythm maybe you need to do a holter depending on the symptom but particularly roughly about two months after the covid this investigation should be done and second thing important thing is that all post covid patients they should not do exercise for at least one and a half or two months they can have a normal walking and a normal routine but exercise program should be started after 6 to 8 weeks and that should be started in a graded manner not on the first day that you run 5 km so this is what is my advice and you know some of the patients who recovered from covid they were discharged they had a certain cardiac death because of ventricular fibrillation because some of these patients had an underlying myocarditis and it was not never discharged So Rahul, I would like to add that. one point to what Dr. Clare said, both for the medical practitioners in the audience and also general public, that if somebody gets RT-PCR positive, COVID is there, disease is mild, they have been quarantined. But I think after third, fourth day, if there is a little flu-like symptom, they all must get the blood test for the inflammatory markers, D-dimer and this uh, CPR. Yeah, so if these markers are high, that means. a poisonous substance called cytokine has started coming up in the body this can create spontaneous clotting inside spoil the lungs create problems and this examples that we hear mild covid quarantine 20 days later suddenly was found dead i have seen in bangalore some young doctors going through that these people who have inflammatory markers positive cytokine started must be under anti coagulation medicines anti clotting medicines and that should be given for 8 weeks if it is not done many people could have clots in the coronary arteries and have a heart uh, heart attacks which could be devastating yeah just rahul uh, just for your information uh, this should not worry you uh, from the perspective these these two gentlemen don't mean to frighten you what they are saying is when in doubt see a doc that's all so uh, the important thing is that if you anyone has had a covid which is severe then a he should be investigated but don't self investigate don't self medicate so the important thing is that it could be an inflammation of the heart but that that's something that the doctors will advise you about so next yeah, question another thing that i want to say uh, donotom is that uh, uh, that covid and post covid believe me lot of patients have anxiety issues lot of patients you know they have anxiety they have a depression they can't sleep and they have some this pain here and there they are so much disturbed that they really need to counseling actually you know i think uh, many of those patients we need to spend time reassure them make them understand that these symptoms will disappear so i call them post covid syndrome of a mixture of mental symptoms depression fatigue some people complain a lot of fatigue i'm not able to walk at all you know normal ejection fraction normal hemoglobin extreme tiredness but believe me i want to assure everybody that 
almost all symptoms will disappear in two three months time so please uh, have a positive attitude and uh, talk to your friends talk to your uh, relations and take medical advice and don't don't use these uh, you know desi kadas they are good for nothing please i don't they are nothing increases immunity by the way people say take ginger take this take that the only way to improve improve your immunity is good exercise nutritious diet and positive attitude positive attitude is very very important to have good immunity believe me next question, next question. How can we diagnose it by self assistance? Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know whether uh, you mean self diagnosis. If the idea is to self diagnose, then this is precisely what these two doctors have just advised you. Kindly don't go by self diagnosis. Self assistance, if it is mental, as Dr. Claire has just pointed out, positive attitude helps. but uh, is there anything that you would like to add dr javri no nothing i think this question if it means how do i diagnose myself no don't do that if you have a doubt go to doctor you always take help we can go to next question next question yeah dr clear can tell no i i i think this is a very good question excellent question yeah. no first of all i want to tell you that how do you diagnose that it is a heart attack Uh, any pain in the chest particularly in the center of the chest in the left side in the left arm on the right side in the jaw if this pain or discomfort it may not be pain it may be just discomfort is a new thing which is was not occurring before and it lasts for more than 20 minutes particularly if you have taken a sorbitol also but the pain is still continued after 20 minutes you must assume this could be a heart attack now if you have a heart attack the first action should be take three tablets aspirin 300 mg clopidogrel 300 mg and dorsetamin 80 mg after taking these pills go to the nearest possible health center where it can be recorded because ecg is the only reliable way to diagnose heart attack. if it is a confirmed heart attack on the ecg then there are two options the best option is to open that artery immediately by doing angioplasty if angioplasty is not possible you are in a place where angioplasty is not available of patient you should have called and we give non bursting drugs sure. uh, either septocardial right. or connective plate and believe me in acute heart attack the most important thing is the time 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 take action immediately don't sit at home don't assume it is a gas don't assume it is acidity go to the hospital take an ecg because if you if you take this three tablets which i told you no harm will be done if you don't have a heart attack a very safe medicine but if you have a heart attack these three medicines will help you lot A single there is a trial to show that a single tablet of aspirin decreases the mortality in acute heart attack by 25 percent. So please note that I think you should tell all your friends to take this tablet in the pocket wherever you travel in the world. I take I keep ten of this set. So if somebody has on the way in the aeroplane in the in the train I am going, I am ready to give to you that person. So thank you. I will just take one more question, and that will be the final question. Uh, already, Doctor Sweet has had to go to attend to a patient. So uh, one final question, be fine, and uh, then we'll wrap it up this session. Is there an yes? Does high or low sugar or sugar a reason for heart attack? Doctor Jawali, would you like to take that? Jawali, you want to give this answer? No, sixty percent of the patients that come to me for bypass surgery have diabetes. So anybody with high low high level of sugar is highly prone to develop heart attacks, heart disease, etc. Problem? Good. Thank you. I think uh, we have run out of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. My thank you all for joining us uh, on behalf of uh, Fortis Healthcare. Let me. Stay a very, very uh, 
healthy heart to all of you who joined today. As I said, 29th September is World Heart Day. And we at Fortis Healthcare wish you all right, a very healthy heart. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I take great pleasure in thanking Professor Ashok Seth, Professor T.S. Clare, and Professor Vivek Javli for being with us today. We thank you for joining us, literally from the bottom of the heart.